Hello Overclockers, I'm 8pack and today I'm going to be reviewing the 4070 by NVIDIA. This GPU replaces the 3070 which was released over two years ago. So, so what we should be looking for is a generational leap in performance. In this video I'll be taking a look at the Asus TUF that we have here and I will be also comparing on a temperature basis with the Dual. So all in all what we'll be looking at is performance, cooling and overclocking. All that being said, let's get into it. Okay, first let's look at the paper specs of the 4070. What we have is a GPU, which is the AD104 GPU, which is the same as on the 4070 Ti. This time, the 4070 has 5888 CUDA cores. Uh, the base clock of the GPU is 1920 MHz, with a specified boost clock of 2475. Some of the OC models that we have in stock are offering a boost clock of 2500 to 2600 MHz. But in fact, the tough model that I tested here on pretty much every single benchmark that I ran was running over 2800 MHz at a minimum of 2805 and often hitting 2850. These cards have 12 GB of GDDR6 memory across a 192 bit memory bus. The base memory clock is 1330 MHz and it's got 21 GB per second effective memory speed. These cards have a built-in hardware decoding for AV1 and H264 within the hardware. So that means obviously that you can push any uh, type switch encoding straight onto the GPU and you don't need to use uh, any CPU encoding. Prices on this card start at around 599 uh, with higher end OC cards obviously have been a little bit more expensive. As far as stock goes, we have around 30 models in stock for launch and for the specific models, you can check out the links in the description below. So let's move on to hardware that we use to test this GPU and my testing methodology. So the CPU I used, as I've been using for all the current generation of GPUs, was the 7950X by AMD, uh, and I'm PBO2 tuning that with a switcher type overclock, exactly the same as I've done previously. What motherboard we're using was Asus Crosshair Extreme uh, with 32 gig of Corsair memory at 6000 megahertz set with uh, EXPO, which I believe is C36. The install of Windows 11 was the latest at Windows 11 installed on a WD NVMe drive with the latest driver that NVIDIA prepared for us for this specific card. Obviously, I couldn't use the same driver as I did for a 4090 because that wouldn't work on this card, so I had to update the driver. And that's the only thing really that was changed. Even the same version of Afterburner did work on overclocking this card. In terms of uh, benchmarks that I ran, I ran all the synthetic style gaming benchmarks that I ran for all the previous GPUs, plus our professional benchmark to show rendering capability, which is Blender. Now, why I chose these benchmarks is that they're there to show the capability of the GPU and what the GPU can actually do, uh, given the preferred or ideal conditions. I'm not here really to show what the GPU can do in uh, Fortnite, for example, at 480p with an uh, old 9th gen Intel CPU with 4 gig of memory on uh, 7200 RPM HDD. That's not my style and will never be so. So please, keyboard warriors, keep your comments to yourself. I'm trying to show what this GPU can do. Okay, now we've looked at the testing methodology, let's go into a little bit about the physical dimensions and the cooling on these cards. So here in front of us, we've got the Dual, uh, which is this one, uh, and we've got the Tuff, which is this one. Both of them, I would say, are more compact than other cards within the 40 series range, especially the Dual. This will fit in pretty much any a PC case without a problem uh, and even small form factor builds can certainly be done with the Dual. Now, I mean if we're just comparing these two cards side by side you can see the Dual uh, has uh, a substantially shorter cooler in terms of dimensions that way and in terms of dimensions here we're talking uh, approximately a two and a half slot cooler uh, maybe almost three slot cooler on the tough to a two and really only a small amount over two slot on the dual, probably about two and a quarter slots, sorry. So uh, quite a bit of difference there. Now we've discussed a little bit about the physical size, let's discuss how I tested the cooling. So for the cooling, I used 3D Mark Port Royal at 4K with the absolute maximum settings on ray tracing. And I, I ran that on loop with the stock frequency, uh, with the stock fan curve for an hour to test on stock. 
And then when I was overclocking, I uh, ramped up the fan curve to between 75 and 80% of maximum, which I, I, you know, I put, in, put on some headphones and I couldn't really hear the fan uh, with the headphones on. So I suspect in a gaming situation, that'd be totally fine for everyone. And what I found after running uh, an hour of Port Royal mixed out on the stock, uh, fan curve with a stock overclocking settings. Uh, I got a maximum GPU temperature of 63.4C uh, and a maximum hotspot temperature of 78.7C. Very, very solid temperatures, well within tolerances. No such thing as throttling, all that kind of thing. Absolutely no need to worry about the cooler. Even better, I got with overclocking, of course I did uh, adjust the fan curve, but uh, again, with overclocking, we do see a big performance boost actually uh, for free performance. Uh, and it, under those overclock settings, we saw uh, a GPU top temperature of 51.2 uh, degrees C with a hotspot temperature of only 63.4. Again, well within settings. And of course, with that tweak on the fan, you'd expect the boost clock to stay at that level for much longer, a lot less variation because they're keeping uh, the CPU temperatures low. So now we've covered cooling, let's talk a little bit about power on these GPUs. The typical board power of these GPUs is around 200 watts and Nvidia are specifying a minimum PSU recommendation of 700 watts. Well, obviously in my testing, I wasn't using a 700 watt PSU. I was using either a 1200 watt Be Quiet PSU or a 2000 watt 8 pack PSU. So I was far exceeding that. So I can't really comment on what the minimum uh, PSU recommendation is here, but I would suspect that 700 watts is actually easily enough to run this uh, with a high end CPU uh, without any problems. Both these cards here have the standard 8-pin PCI Express connector, so you don't need to upgrade your PSU or indeed change your PSU to an ATX version 3 with a PCI Express Gen 5 connector. You can indeed get many, many models with the old-style PCI Express 8-pin. In our range, we do know that several of them, the cards available do support the new connector. Uh, and these cards are cards such as the Aorus Master, the Gigabyte Gaming, the Gigabyte Aero, Palette Gaming Pro, Inno3D, iChill, uh, th those all use uh, the Gen 5 connector. Okay, let's now look at the stock testing results. As I said, for stock testing, this GPU under load was uh, boosting to about 2,805 to 2,810 megahertz consistently under load. And because the cooler is so good, it was keeping those high clocks for the majority of the time. In my uh, synthetic 3D Mark benchmarks at different resolutions, uh, and also my Blender rendering test, the performance of this 4070 I thought was very, very good for, for the price point. Now let's uh, just talk through a few of these uh, scores that I got at uh, around 28. 10, 28, or 5 megahertz. We had um, Time Spy at 4K, uh, 8632. We had Time Spy at 1440p, uh, 18246. Uh, Port Royal at 1440p, and this was with the uh, ray tracing absolutely maxed out, uh, was 11276. Uh, and Port Royal at 4K again with ray tracing absolutely maxed out, was uh, 5061. Fire Strike, we did it 1080p just to show that this card is obviously very good at uh, 1080p uh, gaming, uh, but obviously at 1080p you can't really allow it to stretch its legs and the more bottleneck is in the CPU uh, and other systems. Uh, we had a score of over 43k on that, uh, again a very very good score. Final Fantasy, a gaming benchmark, uh, this again was fully maxed out quality wise and at 4K, we had 7,033 points. The score for Superposition at 4K Optimized, which is quite a high detail benchmark as well as obviously being 4K resolution, was 13,930. Uh, our Blender test, which is basically uh, the OC UK CAN test that we've done many times, maxing out the GPU, uh, and maxing out the GPU memory as much as we can, took 30 minutes, 29.31. Uh, and throughout all these, as I've mentioned before, the temperature was great uh, and the GPU wasn't ever throttling and was keeping the maximum clocks all the time. These maximum clocks are uh, way in advance of what NVIDIA uh, states as a specification. So overall, uh, a great job at stock. Right, now we've gone over the stock performance of the GPU. Let's look at the overclocking. So the software I used for overclocking was MSI Afterburner. Uh, and for this, I was able to max out the power setting, which I believe on this card was 108% of the power that you, you could set to. And I also uh, set the fan to 80% of its maximum, which was uh, not, not really loud, especially if you have headphones on while gaming, you wouldn't particularly notice it. 
What uh, results I got was a GPU clock speed on average of around 30, 60 megahertz, uh, which often actually did boost as high as 30, 75 megahertz, which is a very solid overclock from uh, 2810 or 2805, whatever you want to say uh, from before. It was, you know, it was around those frequencies all the time on stock. So a nice substantial boost uh, in terms of clock speed on the GPU itself uh, of, of around eight stroke nine percent. I was also be able to push the memory, again using Afterburner and the slider, to around plus 550 megahertz. Now the memory did have a little bit of extra uh, bandwidth, if you like, in there, or so, sorry, should I say more headroom. You could go to like push 600, plus 650, but that then limited how high you could go on the GPU. And with overclocking graphics cards, you want to push the GPU first and then the memory. Very similar to an overclocking CPU. When you're overclocking CPU, obviously it's a CPU frequency, then the CPU cache, and then the system memory. Very similar when you're doing this uh, and GPU memory speed can often affect the headroom on the GPU core. So I was maxing out the core and then the memory and I found that 550 megahertz gave the best overall uh, results in the benchmark I was running. How did I check stability uh, for this to make sure it would be gaming stable? I ran Port Royal benchmark with absolutely everything maxed out including ray tracing and all the settings uh, for an hour on loop to just check that you know these settings are going to run pretty much any game uh, that you would throw at it uh, and this these settings uh, passed without a problem uh, and, and the overclocking was indeed very solid and very stable. Now, is the, are these settings repeatable? The answer is really I do not know. As I explained earlier, this is the silicon lottery. You may get cards that are slightly lower at overclocking than this and you may get cards that are uh, quite a bit better at overclocking. I really don't know and we've seen that across the 40 series of cards that, that have already been launched where we've tested you know a very high range of cards. Some will not quite reach 3000 megahertz but some can go uh, over 3100 megahertz. But what I can say is the card that I tried here you know a really solid uh, overclock was achieved uh, of around seven or eight percent extra frequency uh, and a good solid uh, increase on the memory and of course with the, the memory increase in frequency you obviously get better memory bandwidth as well. So what were the results from all these overclocking tweaks and testing that I did? Basically we saw an increase uh, in the superposition benchmark at 4k 4.6%. Uh, times by at 4K, the graphics score was up almost 4%. Uh, times by at 1440p, the graphics score was up 4.4%. In Port Royal at 1440p, we saw a 5% increase. In Port Royal at 4K, we saw a 5.8% increase. In Fire Strike at 1080p, we saw a 5.2% increase. In Fire Uncle Fantasy, which was maxed out on quality and at high resolution of 4K, we saw a 5.8% increase. And finally, the OCUK Blender rendering test we saw a 5.9% uh, increase. Now, what we can see, obviously, with the trend of the results is the more taxing the task is on the GPU, i.e. with something like rendering, stroke high resolution, stroke high detail, the more benefit was gained for overclocking. So if you're gonna use this card, 1440p with everything maxed out, or even, as these have shown, this is a, a decent 4K card, the overclocking is gonna benefit you more, and of course, it's free performance. In, on average, what we saw was an increase in performance from overclocking uh, of around 5%, uh, which is actually very solid. And like I said before, the 8-pin cards, I'm sure, will overclock just as well as 16-pin power supply cards. Uh, and obviously, th in that case, providing you've got 700 watts, you don't need to upgrade your power supply. So, finally, in conclusion. The 4070 is a great card in 1440p and 4K gaming. We've proved the potential here by running uh, these benchmarks. Also with this card, obviously, you can use the old style PSU uh, and the card's cooler is very, very effective. As well as all this, we can get an extra 5% of free performance out of the card by making a few tweaks uh, and overclocking the card. Obviously, as I've explained before, headroom of overclocking will depend on the silicon lottery as it is with any other component. Okay, now for the time for this final sales waffle. If you want to buy one of these cards, you can do so by checking out the links in the description below. If you're not happy with the performance of this card, I suggest you save up and get a 4090. Or even better, save up a bit more and get an 8-pack system. Of course, as always, don't like the video, don't subscribe to the channel, but do check out the beard.